Well, two years later, with a four-figure price tag, this thing had better fucking work. I guess we'll take a look. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and, well, as you probably figured, we're going to have a look at this Pentium 2. This episode's going to be really heavy on the music. Like, sometimes people say I should put music in videos, and I generally don't, because if I put it there, inevitably someone's not going to like it. And let's be honest, everybody now has tabbed browsers. If you want to listen to music, open it in another tab, open it in your media player, and then you can listen to music you want to listen to, and not some crap that I'd play that you probably wouldn't like. Also, finding half-decent music that's not subject to copyright is kind of difficult. But due to the nature of this machine, I'm going to be abusing the horrible music this time, so be warned. Anyway, I suppose we'll get on with this before this intro starts to drag. There's not really anything else I have to say about it, to be honest. The chassis is fairly generic to the late 1990s and early 2000s, in fact we've seen this one before with that K6 in it that didn't work properly. As we know that's not a problem because there's a working K6 around here now and we'll probably see briefly how it compares to this machine later on. Ignore the adhesive plastic, this is from a damaged roll and I just did it to see how it would take on this chassis, how it would look. I'll probably get some more and coat it properly at some time in the future because the paintwork isn't too good on this one and this is cheaper than having it powder coated again and you can do some pretty novel things. But that may be completely needless as this thing's going to live alongside the Pentium 3 so it's probably going to end up sharing the other one of those cases at some point just so they match because well why not. It's not like the Pentium Pro is really doing much in there, it's a nice case. It's no reason to waste it on a useless system like that. At the back we have a regular power supply and an ATX backplane. It's new enough to use this layout but old enough not to have sound on board which I actually kind of like them not having sound on board. And when I talk about the layout I refer to if we go a bit farther back kind of to the Pentium Pro era yeah they used to use a different layout like this quite often. The trend I would probably be able to figure out what video card we have in here, even without the logo, but we'll get there shortly. Networking is present as usual, but below that we have some audio connectors, plenty of them on this thing, hinting at this machine's job, and we do have SCSI sticking out there, that may prove to be more useful later on than it currently is. Opening up the case, we... This power supply doesn't conform to the older ATX standards. You see, originally the fan was actually meant to be on the bottom of the power supply to cool the processor. Anyway, that aside, the processor in here is a 450MHz Pentium 2, it's just like the one I had before. These were good CPUs, but they seem to be far less common than the 400MHz model. Likely as they didn't come out that long before the Pentium 3 models did, that would work in the same motherboards, usually. Given the Katmai had half-speed cache as well, you had to wonder how it actually holds up clock for clock. Was it faster or was it just a marketing gimmick? I mean, they're basically the same architecture. I can't really see where there would be much of any noticeable difference. It's something I do intend to test someday, but it's not very high on the priorities list, and I don't own a 450MHz Pentium 3 right now, so... Yeah, I can't test it today, otherwise I might have done. Yeah, I'm going to do my best to uh, get this for you, but there's actually a design flaw in the older, like, larger cartridge design like this, where that heat spreader doesn't touch the cache chips. But you'll notice those cache chips are unusually thin, it makes me wonder if maybe Intel changed them at some point for thinner ones and then just never updated the heat spreader. Because a lot of chips were thicker than that, certainly. You can see the uh, CPU is over there, and it is touching it, but only just. It's not sprung or anything. To be honest, I've always been a little bit distrusting of the heat spreader on these. I've not really had a problem with them yet, but yeah, you can see how the CPU is uh, ball grid. The cache bin there is kind of interesting in its own right, because it's still technically external cache, I guess, because it's, it's not part of the CPU, really. It's just part of the card the CPU is on. 
I mean, if it's like part of the motherboard, as it is on later socket 7 ones, that's what the CPU plugs into there. You don't class that as bin internal, do you? So, yeah. It's also half speed, so, well, the Celeron, when that got cached then, would technically have more in common with the Pentium Pro than these, even though it's the same architecture. Well, whatever. I guess we'll go back to that voiceover man, because I, I, can, I can hear him getting, uh, getting impatient in the background. Uh, yeah. The motherboard is a QDI P6 I440BX which kind of tells us what chipset it has. It's a different revision of the same model of board I had in the Sterling Pentium 2. This one feels cheaper and it looks cheaper. It doesn't seem to be quite as well made or even quite as stable when it's running, but it's about as well as we're ever going to do now, and it's good enough. Or I guess it is. Pretty much has to be, really, doesn't it? I know I sound disappointed, but these are fantastic boards, really, if, if you can find one. It took two years to track down this one, and the price of it is not going to be disclosed, but yeah, uh, wasn't particularly cheap. Let's put it this way, my Sega Terra Drive did not cost as much as this motherboard. For memory, this system uses 256 megabytes of ECC SD RAM, which is a little overkill, let's be honest. But there were fast modules I found that would do the job in here. Most of them are 66 MHz or broken, and well, these ones are supported. They'll do 100 MHz, and why not put them in here? They're gonna work. They're not rated for 133 MHz operation, so they wouldn't really be useful in anything else I have. Now, as we're running Windows 98, there should never be any need for more RAM than this on this machine. In fact, 256 megabytes should give us a license to be outright wasteful and still have room left over to play with. For video, a Matrox Productivia G100 was used. It's just like in the other Pentium 2. Again, you can sort of see the pattern here that I'm essentially trying to rebuild that thing. And like the one in that machine, this is the SD RAM version. Supposedly the SG RAM version of this card is no faster than this one. They're cheap enough that I might get one and try it someday, but the speed isn't too important here. Image quality at high resolutions was my main priority here. DOS speed been the next and not really a big deal as the CPU is fast enough to make up for it even if the video card was slow. The Matrox G100 does hold the aces in these departments though, it was a clear winner when it came to choosing a card for this machine, and of course the original machine that this is filling the boots of. Excuse the sys uh, heatsink here, it's from a dead motherboard, and as it was doing nothing useful on there, it seems right to make it useful somewhere else. It fit on here, and well it does its job. The G100 doesn't need a heatsink, but it can't hurt to add one for extra peace of mind. I mean, it's not a 3DFX card after all, so yeah, heat problems probably aren't that much of a concern, but like I said, it doesn't hurt to run it a little bit cooler, does it? Below this is a NIC, an SMC branded model which can do 100 megabits per second full duplex, though you'll notice Thin Ethernet and AUI were gone by now. Hopefully this card can be replaced with a D-Link in the future, as those are better in my opinion. The, the TMC driver isn't fantastic, it does have some stability problems and performance issues. It works well enough for now though, and it's not that much of a concern, because I don't network too heavily on here, just the odd file of a few kilobytes really, so... Yeah, I'm not, not going to rush on this. Next is the sound card. This is Yamaha YMF 724, which isn't quite as good as the old one. It's a late revision. Seriously, I don't think I'll ever find another card like that. For one thing, some inputs and outputs are absent, and the SP diff cannot be used at the same time as analog ins and outs, which is pointless. Not only due to the lack of analog input in such a mode, but also as there's no SP diff input on here. Now these kind of things seem to be common with Yamaha 724s in general, which I wasn't so aware of when I made the video about mine that I used to have. Also be warned that the card maker has omitted some vital circuitry from the PC speaker input, so you'll have to build some kind of voltage divider or stick a matching transformer in if you want to avoid melting some wires when connecting that up. Note the ugly little board that's isolated with tape over that. This is still a good card, and it, it works well enough, for the most part, 
but it's a very late model of the chip and it only seems to work with one extremely late version of the driver. This is a WDM driver as opposed to VXD which I preferred running on the old card. VXD drivers don't support this, there are no VXD driver versions that will run with this card. The only driver this works with does not offer any FM synthesis, even in DOS. Most SPDIF capabilities have been removed or severely crippled. Seemingly all done to add A3D support I won't even fucking use. At least it's not SRS technology. Besides, it could be far worse. This is a fake Yamaha 744, as far as I can tell. The card I had in here when this machine was first been built. It needs a funky driver I can't find again now, and that was hard to find in the first place. I'm really sorry. The card seems to be made by a company called Typhoon if you want to try and track it down. The PCI vendor and device IDs match no other card that I'm aware of in existence. It's clearly a rip-off of the Yamaha X-Wave. The SB link does nothing, and if you're not familiar with this interface, it connects some signals on the ISA bus that are missing on the PCI bus, mostly for Sound Blaster compatibility. Or it should, but as we established, it doesn't do anything on this card, and the Yamaha DOS configurator will lock up if you try to run it with this card installed. There was no FM synth on this card either, and the wavetable just sounded really off. Listen to this. In comparison to a real Yamaha. Yeah, this fake 744 seems to be a really primitive sample player. In fact, it's about on par with the uh, Dream Blaster, so hell, if you can find one of these and it's cheap, well, I guess you won't need one of those, but you're gonna not have any real Sound Blaster compatibility, I guess. The inputs on this fake card also use strange pinouts and often don't seem to work properly or be tied together in peculiar ways. The PC speaker header isn't connected to anything at all and it's not populated. This card arguably has some advantages over the 724 installed now though, namely that it uses only a single IRQ and it can do SP diff when the analog sources are turned on. The problem being that it doesn't really seem to be real SP diff and it behaves as though an ADC is present somewhere, one which is just tapping the analog output and converting it to AES, digital output. Also, the surround connections appear to be completely fake. They just output the front audio with slight panning and the sound oddly sharpened or muffled. So, yeah, it doesn't matter what setting you put in the control panel they had. It's just going to produce stereo sound with some weird noises in the other speakers. We'll come back to sound cards in this machine shortly. Now we have audio connectors for a line level input source. This comes from another card that doesn't offer an internal header, though I may hardwire some cables to that card to save a slot later on if required. The next card is an Adaptec 2940 UW Pro. It's a bit overblown for just running a CD drive, but that drive has problems and I wanted to make sure it wasn't just the card before I invested money into replacing the drive, because these faster SCSI CD drives can get quite expensive in the United Kingdom, a bit like pretty much anything really. The CD burner is a Yamaha 2100S, and I do intend to replace it with the same model or a very similar one at some point. It isn't super urgent, it's doing well enough for now, as long as you don't read too much from the disc it'll be okay, but eventually it'll just stop working and lock the system up. And if I may just interject, I'm sure somebody's going to remember the box, and yes, the included Easy CD does work and the mascot is bloody terrifying. I mean, seriously, it looks like a demented Rayman wannabe. Somebody please kill it. And no, I haven't found a way to turn it off. It's like Clippy, but worse, because it'll give you nightmares. There is a chance that this system will end up on SCSI hard drives at a later date, because these laptop IDE ones are quite slow. 
Though again, there's no sense of urgency to do anything about this. The IDE drives work and their slow speed isn't that much of an issue just because of the small file sizes that this thing really works with. So it's an upgrade that might never happen. Depends on what shape these Atlas drives turn out to be in, given their apparent failure seems to have been oxide on the connectors that somehow formed over time, and also managed to knock out the CPUs in their machine for a while. Yeah, really weird, no doubt we'll have to see what became of that system sometime, because it's getting worked on at the moment, because I do want to use it for audio recording for music alongside this thing. Next is the DigiDesign Sample Cell 2. This is an older car that had every potential to be really good and really useful, but it comes with no editor to create new programs, so it's barely more than a ROM plug, as DigiDesign only ever really bothered supporting the PCI version, which was really nice of them. Companies that make expensive, elaborate hardware, especially companies from California, if it's in the United States, or companies from Germany, if it's in Europe, seem to have a knack for not supporting their hardware properly, trying to lock things down, just finding ways of costing you more money, and generally just being dicks. So, yeah, I don't know why, but that seems to happen more often than not. Still, it's a shame, because it would be convenient to do everything with sampling from the PC itself, but I guess the Akai S3200 is going to have to stay around for now. I mean, it's more capable than this card anyway, so it's a far trade-off, but it is annoying having to get up and mess with the sampler when I can do everything else from the keyboard and mouse. Uh, maybe we can get some software for that sampler to mess with it from the PC. I mean, they have the SCSI interface on the back, and... Well, we might be able to use that, but Akai really only supported Mac. Unless you wanted to write operating system disks, then they only supported DOS and write into the wrong type of floppy that your sampler doesn't take, which is the only reason I have this S3200, because there's no way to get a new disk on the 2000, really. It doesn't work with floppy emulators, and, well, it's basically a lost cause. I'm not replacing the floppy disk with another old one, the S3200 stores its OS in ROM, so it doesn't have this problem. You know, I'd like to interject and uh, point out a kind of problem. Jeez, that has pulled some dart through that fan. But that fan is the point of interest. If you have an S3200 and it's got the Magneto optical drive, you really should have this fan. Now, what's strange is Akai, according to their own instructions, say you should have this installed if you are using the MO drive. But the MO drive is a standard feature on this model and they didn't include the fan so by their own their own standards they've sold you a unit that you shouldn't use that should fail and the MO drive will break it will stop working if it's not cooled adequately so you will need to install this 80 millimeter fan now according to the internet the header is 12 volts my unit supplies 24 volts to that header so I don't know whether there's something wrong with the board in mine, or if the documents are wrong, or if there's different revisions. But do check that before you go plug in a regular PC fan in there, because they are just standard 80mm, which I'm surprised at. But do check that, because otherwise you're going to have to do what I have, and leech power from the, the Molex connectors to the MO drive, or to the floppy drive, the, the bag connectors there. Because otherwise, yeah, you might just knacker the fan. This one needs cleaning, it's very dirty. Meanwhile, some of the programs that come with this DigiDesign sample cell card are quite nice, and the interface is decent, so it can stay. These might just add to the odd song. Let's have a quick listen to a few things rendering through it.
I mean, that was very quickly just faffing around. It maybe deserves to be upgraded to the full 32 megabytes just for those alone, as some of them conveniently need it. Some of the sounds on the two included libraries, and, well, I don't have enough RAM in there to use them right now. I can upgrade it later. Also, it's really nice of the manual to tell you to throw out the packaging. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Lastly, the RAM slots are interesting and also a little bit scary. You see, you have to use this tool, push it through the hole on your module, and then twist it against the slot. Yeah, they slot in instead of snapping in like most. It's weird, and it's not something I'm really a fan of, personally. It seems like a lot of stress is being applied to something that's quite fragile, and it makes these horrible, horrible noises sometimes. Below is the Roland SCC-1. Oh, God. Yeah, this card is here for one reason. It's just acting as a, a, a MIDI interface to echo system-exclusive messages through the machine and back out of the Yamaha 724. Largely virtual CZ running on a newer machine for faster programming of the Casio synthesizers that I have. I suppose we might use the sound canvases... Uh, noise making thing from Toys R Us and Mario Kart if we ever play a game on this thing that uses the sound canvas for its soundtrack like Duke Nukem 3D does but we might as well just use the Yamaha instead most of the time because it's better anyway hey have you ever heard a Yamaha XG synth playing the Duke Nukem 3D soundtrack with its mode actually set correctly for a change yeah I don't mean like this No, I mean, I mean like this. Yamaha made that manual for a reason, you know. Now, there is a point of interest I do think we should go over very quickly, and that is if we compare this sound canvas to Yamaha's similar SW60 from a few years later, there is an age gap between these then yeah you can see that like everything else Yamaha built in the 90s it's certainly a lot better looking than Roland's efforts that Roland card just no matter what you do it looks cheap and nasty and uh, it even makes a very interesting sound when dropped listen to this sounds like you dropped a pack of watch screwdrivers only Roland could make something that cheap and tacky and try and class it as a, a somewhat upmarket product Yamaha, though, on the other hand, I do very specifically state the 1990s. Roland and Yamaha both really about as bad as each other back in the 1980s. Yamaha's 1980s manufacturing is, quite honestly, some of the worst I have ever seen. Uh, but yeah, these have an issue in common, and it affects most any device that has anything to do with audio. Any peripheral, certainly. And that is that you'll notice neither of them have any form of header to connect them to a sound card. Yamaha have ones for CD-ROM drives, but nowhere to connect either of these cards to your sound card. And it's not limited to these cards. No, because you know what's the worst for it? Capture cards. Look at that. Look, that would have had a header, but it's not populated. Now, granted, we could populate it, and we did, but what's the deal? Why does nobody ever put those on? It's the burn of this damn hobby that you have to run cables out the back of the machine all the time and it's just stupid I'm sick to death of it so I'm going to modify this card I'm just going to attach a cable a bit like the one I've done on the TV card and I'm just going to solder it to the underside of those jacks because I'm tired of it and it's worse than the slot and this fucking thing is supposed to be in that slot where those audio cables are yeah but here's the thing, Roland were a bit ahead of the curve, like Yamaha were, were been like somewhat smart, they put a line input on there, so like, well we know somebody might want to do something, so at least you're not having to waste an input on the sound card, you'll just pass the sound card through here, you'd probably be alright. I mean yeah, it's messy, I don't like it, I'd rather the wires were inside my machine, but Roland were way ahead of them, they don't offer you an audio input, but they do require a breakout cable to use the MIDI, 
or at least an adapter, because they use their own proprietary stupid connectors. Now, I know you couldn't put a full-size one on, but I mean, come on. But hell, we're all and we're ahead of the curve, because guess what? No one I had mentioned capture cards. Well, look how capture cards work today. They all have their own proprietary breakout. In fact, them there, everything needs one now. So they were ahead of the curve. Because nowadays, if you work on a modern PC and it's anything but the most simplistic piece of shit, it's going to need at least one proprietary piece of crap cable like that just to get something done. It's like working on hardware from the 60s and 70s, which is something I don't want to do. I get no pleasure in doing that because I hate things being locked down that way. And it's one of the reasons I don't like modern machines and why you won't see me playing with them. It's because of stupid things like that. Nonetheless, more on topic, yeah, I don't know why people have this aversion to populating these stinking headers. Just an endless annoyance. I suppose I should mention that those IDE laptop drives are 20 gigabyte 5400 RPM drives made by Fujitsu. Originally there were six and they would have used the Promise SX6000. But the problem is, Promise were making really crappy products when this card hit the shelves. And it's slower than just using the drives on their own with the Intel 440BX chipsets Ultra DMA33 interface. It's also rather unreliable. And it stores the information in this rather volatile little thing that strongly resembles real-time clock chips. Yeah, I'm not really trusting this thing, so... Hmm. It's just not a good card. I wouldn't waste your time with these. It does look impressive, though, and I'd screw it to my wall if there was anything to screw into. Now, sound cards. This thing went through a few. Obviously, there was that fake Yamaha 744 we started off with. Then there was the Turtle Beach Pinnacle. This card was paired with the Sound Blaster 16 Vibra for a time. Now let me warn you very quickly, the Vibra XV has a design flaw in its drivers where the 8-bit and 16-bit DMA use the same label and therefore you can only set the DMA to values of 3 or higher which is going to give you compatibility problems in older games which expect the 8-bit DMA to be at a lower value than this certainly. The Turtle Beach card appears only as an MPU-401 to DOS applications, although its joystick port can be enabled for them with the use of a driver, but it takes up a bit of conventional memory, so I wouldn't bother. The Vibra 16 was simply there for compatibility and the extra inputs, as well as echoing MIDI through the machine, a bit like the Sound Canvas does now. Naturally, having things set up this way sacrificed having a Yamaha synth and meant the MU90R would have to be permanently tied to this system. The problem is the drivers for the Turtle Beach card suck, and its wavetable isn't actually very good. This card cost about £600 when it released, and they couldn't even be bothered to write installers or uninstallers for it. Yeah, the uninstaller is just a batch file which Mostly just brings up instructions and gets you to do everything yourself by hand. Simply printing instructions to the screen, maybe opening an applet or a, a notepad session and being like, hey, there you go, do it yourself. Even as a power user, this is just plain unacceptable. I'm sorry, but this is absolutely terrible and I'm not sure I can take Turtle Beach stuff seriously after this. I've got very little experience with the things they've made, but it's not leaving a very good impression. Now given the crappy software support and really weird overly elaborate hardware that could have been useful if it was done better, you would never guess where this company used to reside, would you? The plug and pray implementation is completely broken as well, in fact the only way you'll get the card working in a machine is generally to turn off plug and play on your motherboard, assuming you can. The RAM is also a curious thing, because I never once found a way to load my own samples into the card properly, and the software is a real bitch. For example, I had the Sound Blaster 16 as the preferred output for sound in Windows, so it was the default mixer you'd get if starting Windows Volume Control. The problem being that the Turtle Beach software removes this from the registry every time the system boots to replace it with their own, so you would have to use a shortcut placed elsewhere to get in and change volume levels on the Sound Blaster 16. The card also does have SPDIF, 
but through the mic port. Turtle Beach offer the workaround and basically encourage you to haphazardly stick RC Ajax onto the back of the mic merge selection jumper to do this. You also need this extra card that gets in the way of components on your motherboard and just sort of fits awkwardly on the side here. I'm, I'm really not keen on this. Honestly, it's not a good card, and I can't recommend it for any reason beyond novelty today, though at least it's not liable to cost you 600 quid like it did when it was new. I'm absolutely intrigued. It's no wonder you just don't see these around. How is that wavetable anyway? I guess we should have a listen to it. Keep in mind the reverb and chorus are global, or it certainly seemed that way from what experimentation I did, and even then I wouldn't really call that reverb so much as a really fast delay with no high pass filter at all. Certainly sounds more like that rather than an actual reverb most of the time, but uh, it's, it's just not that pleasant. It's not the worst I've heard by a long way, but damn, thanks for the RAM. Those will go pretty nicely in my Adaptex SCSI raid cards anyway, so at least we got something out of it. I'm not sure if you can use the card without having RAM installed. I would have to check the manual. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, that's what the sample sells like. Lead us to say we ended up with the Yamaha 724 and the sound canvas. Seems to work, so it's probably going to stay like this unless I can find another Yamaha like I had before. Oh yeah, now you see, the thing with this Turtle Beach Pinnacle card that we spoke about is, well, you get a good impression from the start, because the first thing you're supposed to read is headed in Comic Sans. That's a real sign of a professional job, that. I would totally trust that. You know, that totally doesn't look like something a depressed, middle-aged, batshit insane feminist school teacher has written, does it? Which was kind of what my teacher was like, and wrote everything in Comic Sans, if you're wondering where I got that idea from. Yeah, well of course, you're going to have to read all of that shit because as we've established, Turtle Beach don't really think it's worth their time to write installers. You know, I, I bet you'd never guess where they were from with all the awkward software and everything, would you? Oh no, it's a total mystery. Never entered anybody's minds. I don't know why, and I hate to bash on one place, but when I consistently see the same bullshit from more than one vendor, you have to start wondering what's in the air or in the water around there, because why? I just don't understand. At least Germany made the Terratech Maestro, so for all the terrible things they made, like Spears Media Effects, which is an Ensonic S2000, essentially, which is a terrible card, they at least made something good in the form of that maestro. Problem is, the maestro is expensive. On the upside, it's not as expensive as this uh, Turtle Beach. So if you can get one of these cheap, yeah, do it, sell it, and buy a Terratech. Because I can't recommend any use for this damn thing. It's absolutely pointless. Like, you can use it as a wavetable card on its own. It won't interfere with the Sound Blaster resources, but... The software's horrible, as we know, it likes to force everything else out of the way, and the wavetable sounds shit, so not worth having, in my opinion. Cannot recommend it. And now the Yamaha, I'm not through with that. I'm actually not that pleased with it, because it is a good card. But I'd like to retract how brilliant I made out it was when I did a video on it. It's still better than the alternatives if you're stuck with PCI. The MIDI interface is good, as in it actually works, where it doesn't on a lot of cards. The wavetable on it's really useful, especially when it's set up properly. The inputs and outputs are usually clean, and, well, it's not a bad card, but it's missing a lot of features, because most of them are F revisions of the chip, which are very late. They'll only work with WDM drivers. They use two interrupts. They're very awkward about Sound Blaster, IRQ, and DMA. They have a lot of compatibility problems the early revision didn't and they don't actually sound as good, in my opinion, and as we know with mine, it doesn't expose an FM synth, which I wasn't going to use heavily in this machine, but 
I noticed it was missing, so that's enough to cause me an annoyance, especially with it wasting two interrupts. I'm, I can't abide by that, and I can't abide by the fact that digital on it is absolutely useless. It's to a point where if I get that SW60 working, might end up putting an Envy in here or something if the MIDI interface is any good on it, but I just don't know. So, yeah, if you stuck with PCI, still go with a 724, I guess, but don't get as excited about it as, as, as we did, because I didn't realise how lucky I was with the card I had, and I don't think I'm going to find another one of those. I'm still looking, because this one's nowhere near as good, and it does annoy me in a few departments, especially having to make my own circuitry, but that's going to be vendor-specific. Uh, you know, if you can do ISA, do ISA, uh, if you can get away with it, I think is just the only real winning solution if you want DOS stuff. In my case, that's not the priority. I'm using this for composing. It's doing fine now. But anyways, yeah, back to the point of this video, I suppose, before we get any farther off track. Because I can just stand here and ramble all day, as we know. Now, using this system is, well, uh, it's like using a fast Pentium 2. It runs Windows 98 Second Edition extremely well. And this is ideal for music related tasks, as there is no HAL. We have a fairly decent path to the hardware here, so timing sensitive things aren't as much peril of losing sync as they would be with a Windows NT derivative. You do realise that I have to render my music one channel at a time, right, in most circumstances. Yeah, you don't think I just slap this on a timeline in Kirkwalk and hit play, do you? No, I have to listen to shit like this for hours on end. just the nature of working with all the synthesizers, they can only really render one channel. The CZ does have a party trick, you can actually render eight channels but they're monophonic so there'll only be one note on each and obviously controllers like volume are global so it's not that useful but you could technically do it if you wanted to. It wouldn't sound anywhere near as good though and well nobody really does that if they can help it. In benchmarks, this thing is naturally in the same ballpark as the K62, and despite being clocked lower, they do trade places in some tests, showing a pretty sizable difference in their architecture. There is no doubt in my mind that the Pentium 2 has a faster floating point unit, and it has much better grasp on memory, and clock for clock, it's probably the better CPU. But remember, the K6 was cheaper. In fact, it really competed in the Celeron market, the K6, a lot of the time. And, well, you would be hard-pressed to find better bang for your buck, really. I mean, yeah, I think the Cyrix processors were probably cheaper than AMD's K6, but the K6 just kicked ass. Like, if you bought a K6 back then and actually got a decent motherboard for it, you weren't really going to lose out. Like, they were good machines, which we know because we've had a look at the one I have, and it's a good machine. But slot 1 systems with Pentium 2 and Pentium 3 processors were really expensive, and you probably didn't see many 450MHz Pentium 2s out there. You still do it just doesn't seem people bought them. There are quite a few K6 2500s around, however, so yeah, that, that makes you think. People seem to have been quite sensible there. It's probably what I would have done back then. Unfortunately, I was stuck with a 386 at that time, as we know, so I can only dream of such things. All in all, then, it's a good showing by both systems, and a real demonstration of how I've not been awkward when I respond to your what system should I get type questions with, well, what are you trying to do with it? You can, though, clearly see here that we are reaching a point where these old DOS tests don't really matter. Doom is capped at 35 frames per second in normal gameplay, apparently, so it's going to run the same on both of these machines, minus subtle differences or the, the vastly different wavetables that they have in. And, of course, even Quake, you know, yeah... It's not going to be a problem. I mean, you're getting more than 15 frames a second. It's going to play fine. And if you're picky, you're getting more than 30 frames a second still. So it's definitely going to be fine. I'd love to run some Windows tests, but they won't work on here. So Cinebench 9.5 scores, well, zero, because it won't start. 
Pass Mark 6 scores error message and Quake 3 Arena and games using its engine don't run on any system I've ever built, aside from maybe that Duran I had right years ago, for reasons completely unknown, in this case yielding nothing but a white screen on both machines. I'm sorry, but I tried. I cannot be held accountable for id software's incompetence or the ridiculous requirements other software has or whatever the problems are. Passmark not letting me have my license key back, so I've been cracking their software ever since and continue to do so. Fuck paying for Passmark. Also, I'd rather not fuck with my configuration here too much to get these things working, because the machine wasn't built to do that kind of thing anyway, and I, I don't want to mess anything up. It's primarily for music, this thing. Though, it does double up as a nice platform for running the build games, like running Shadow Warrior at high resolutions. Let's have a look at that. Hey, sword! That's a personal weapon! Cowabunga! Nukem 3D is smooth at 1024 by 768 as well. This is the original DOS executable. You can put pretty much any resolution you want into the configuration file. And as long as your Visa BIOS or driver exposes that mode, it will run in some capacity. Of course, you'll need a fast enough machine to do it if you're going to start ramping the resolutions up here or the frame rate's going to tank pretty fast. It seems to cut it in half every time you about double the screen size, which, well, that makes sense, I guess, but you're drawing like four times as many pixels, technically, so, yeah, uh, interesting how that curve emerges when you actually think about it. Your heads-up display might start disappearing or something, though, if you, you get silly with it. We can't really blame the game if that happens, because, well, they likely didn't want you to do this kind of thing. Probably never even considered it. Well, actually they did, because these modes were available in Lame Duke. That Matrox comes into its own here, because it has the speed, but it also has the clarity. There's no real way to show you, but damn does the picture look nice coming out of this thing, especially if you put it on a high-quality monitor. It's quite easy to see why Matrox cards show up in places like medical imaging. It's, uh, they're really precise cards. The Windows interface will be in 1280 by 1024 most of the time, but the monitor I use when capturing doesn't support that, so it's lower for now and it's still perfectly usable. Again, the Matrox card really does come into its own in these high-res modes. They were, and in many ways still are, the go-to for multi-monitor implementations too, if you're interested in that, with cards which support it. This one only has a single port, so we won't be doing that on here. Nonetheless, for music, have to wonder, how does this thing handle? Well, you've been hearing the results throughout this video so far. There has not been one drop note or missed beat here. This thing handles just great, even in complex songs where the T3200SX might slow down and the Pentium 4, yes, even the Pentium 4 would run into timing problems, though in that case largely due to its HAL or hardware abstraction layer implementation. Most everything you have heard was rendered with my main workhorse, the Casio CZ1 or the CZ5000 synthesizer. The, there are copious amounts of Akai S3200 in the track you're hearing now, as well as some hints of Yamaha MU90R, largely for drums and pianos respectively. So there we go, this thing's finally as done as it'll likely ever be. It's not as good as the original, and compromises have to be made at every turn but it will do just fine 99% of the time, I am sure. I'm quite happy with it, it's doing what it's supposed to do. In fact, music-wise, the only thing I can flaw, other than the things I've had to compromise on, is the fact it does seem to play things ever so slightly fast, but it does so consistently. You may be gaining an extra beat for every 10 minutes or something, so 
Well, as long as it's happening at the same rate all the time, it makes no difference because I'll only have to sync everything once in one place and it'll all run just fine. So I'm not at all worried about this. Every machine is slightly out anyway and the only way around it is going to be probably to start sequencing on a real-time operating system and that's something I'm not really prepared to do just because it would be immensely awkward to set up. I don't know what software's out there, and I'm just too used to using Cakewalk 9. It's got me this far, and as I say, it's not really specific to this machine. The old one used to do it as well. Every machine does this. It's just the way things are. I think that's enough, I don't think we really need to go any farther, I mean I could stand here and rattle on about things for hours, you know, to the point where we'll get down to like individual jumper positions on hard drives or something, and I don't think we need to know about that really. Uh, this machine, it works, I'm happy with it, I'm never going to be totally happy with it, even if it was identical to my old one I'd still be really pissed, because it's not my old one, and it's not as good, it honestly isn't, it's not as stable, because the eye cheaped out on this motherboard because it's a late revision they've started cutting bits off even the connectors the PCI connectors are visibly cheaper than the earlier revision the bias chip is soldered to the board so I dare try updating it and I think it's on the latest version anyway it's just not as good the sound cards not as good because I haven't got SP diff I've got no FM synthesizer the video card doesn't work properly, I need to replace it. Occasionally it goes a little bit weird, like it starts corrupting the display. It doesn't seem to be a dry joint, so I have no idea. Luckily the G100's are that cheap, I'll just pick another one up. Maybe get the SG RAM version, see if it really isn't any faster. Because, I mean, I can't see it causing me a problem if it's slower, to be honest. It's, it's not like we're doing 3D on this thing. Let's be, let's be honest, we're doing the Windows interface. You know, it's, it's, it just needs to have a really clear picture at high resolutions and be reasonably responsive at redrawing the window so it doesn't lag cakewalk out. 
Um, if it can do that, it's good enough. And Mare trucks really do win in that department for cars from this time. I mean, we could probably cheat and install like a really, really late AGP car, but use way too much power and there's just no point. But I like the G100, it integrates nicely with what I'm doing. But yeah, uh, some people are worth mentioning. I think here yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Dexor and Lame Guy for helping me get this Yamaha car to work, or at least trying to help me. I, I seem to think I ended up having to find a driver somewhere else because it's such a late revision of the chip and it needs a, some weird crack doing to make it work. But thanks for the help with it because. Yeah, I was sort of stuck and obviously thanks for trying to help with the fake one, I mean obviously that turned out to be fruitless because it, it doesn't seem to be real but the one we're running now is real, it's just a very late revision. Uh, thanks to Rob Wolf for the TV card uh, and thanks to the Flying Scotsman because it, he did offer me parts early on when my old P2 got stolen. But I think you can see now why I didn't want to take them, how I've been very picky about the machine and I would have felt bad bashing on how much it annoyed me that it's not perfect and stuff if it was parts I'd taken from somebody else. I guess that's just one of my personality flaws or something. Either way, it's worked out in the end near enough. It still needs a few tweaks. Don't really have anything else to say about it now, as I said. I think, uh, I think that covers this machine. Uh, but anyway, I am I'm done with this for today. I'm going to get out of here. So, as usual, I'm High Treason, thanks a lot for watching, and always remember, don't be a screwer, look, DOS 622. few words, no notes were harmed by the Yamaha DX7 in the making of this video. In fact, not one single note in this video came out of this synthesizer, and it probably never will, because this thing's terrible. Maybe could do a video on it someday if it hadn't decided to break down and become very unreliable, which it probably always was. Also, it's a death trap because it's the US version, which doesn't have a ground pin on its plug, and there's a capacitor in here in the power supply that's referenced to mains connects to the chassis which is aluminum as far as I can tell and it breaks down over time so you can guess what happens when you've got it plugged in can't you? Not very safe if you touch something else at the same time you know the knobs on my stereo are metal so I'll reach behind me to turn the stereo down what do you think happens? Yeah, terrible so not only does it sound bad and operate badly but it's potentially life threatening as well However, the challenge, as always, is that these Yamaha and Roland instruments from the time period are supposedly vastly superior to these Casio synths, and, well, I'm not that good at music. I don't really know that much of what I'm doing. I've learned a little bit over the years, but I'm still basically just bashing keys until I get sort of close enough to what I want. So the challenge is still there. If you own some of this shit, Come at me, try and make something better, try and do the same thing better. Nobody's taken it up yet, nobody's done it, so what the hell am I supposed to make of that? Because I know I'm not brilliant, so you must really suck. And I've had this rant before, it infuriates me the most when it's somebody out there, they've got millions of hits, millions of subscribers, they've got hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of this equipment, and they don't even make music, they'll perk a few damn keys and probably make a living off of doing that, just posting it on the internet. And it's like, you're supposed to be better than me, do something better, I want to hear it. I want to hear some professional grade musician with proper recording equipment and shit come in and make something that blows my crap out of the water. And it just almost never happens, I've seen so little of it over the years. But whatever, I could rant all day, I've made my point, I'm getting out of here, because it's not going to happen, it's never going to happen, it never fucking does. 
what am I supposed to make of that? It's always left to the guy in his living room, isn't it? It's the way it'll always be, and then someone else will come in, make some of crap, take the credit for it, and get all the attention. Just as well, I don't want the bloody attention, it'd be a hassle. But <laughs> somebody probably does. Sucks to be them, I guess. Fuck this world, man. It blows sometimes. It really does. Not for me. I've got a Casio. I don't have any of the problems these people are going to have trying to make something. That thing just fucking works. <laughs>